everyone. My name is Tony Biscari. I'm a researcher at the Finnish Meteorological Institute. Unfortunately, I couldn't join you today. They're live online, but I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk to you about the work we've been doing at the Institute in trying to kind of include biodiversity impacts on the agricultural systems with a little bit of trickery with calibration. So the Twin project, which this work is a part of, is a primarily University of Helsinki-led um, task or project where the idea is to look at, try to examine in this one field in different plots, how the biodiversity and the level of biodiversity affects those plots at a multitude of level from soil health to mi microfauna to the crop growth and crop health and resist resistance to carbon allocation and also the carbon stocks generally in the soil. So the way this is done is that there's one primary crop, the cash crop, barley here, and then there are eight different kinds of cover crops. And we have plots with the barley alone. We have plots with barley and one, multiple plots with barley and one cover crop. And then we have different combinations. And the idea is to look at like the functional diversity, how it affects things and so forth. Now, the part of the project I'm involved with is trying to consider how can we get these biodiversity effects into the models. And this is a challenging one because as everyone here probably knows, models don't do biodiversity. Like there's no way to include them in the model so far. Uh, so for example, here we use sticks for the modeling purpose and STIX is developed by INRA specifically for these kinds of agricultural systems. It's really parameterized in order to have all these kinds of field management options included. However, even that basically only in their current version, you can have the cash crop and you can have one cover crop and their interactions, there are radiation transfer and water stress. So even in this system, there really isn't much of that ability to get, if we have this theory that the biodiversity has an impact, there really isn't a way to include that in a model. So what we wanted to try was a little bit of asset trickery because we have the barley and what really people are interested in, or like not as researchers, but the farmers, the people in the know, the businesses are two things. First of all, the carbon exchanges, and the carbon stocks and the yields because the yields are where the money is. So the what we actually thought was to try to find a little bit of a side avenue, or like a side path to do this in that we know we have barley in all these different systems. So why don't we calibrate the barley to represent the old, based on the overall impacts and the biodiversity have on the system? So we have one barley that's just if it's growing alone and we have another barley PFT in systems where the barley is growing with, say, white clover, and trying to get from that, like from the different parameters as the actual behavior in that system, even if we don't include the biodiversity as a mechanic in itself. So this required running a lot of runs and in different conditions and with different kinds of cell observations and so forth. So we ended up using 4D and bar, for dimensional ensemble variational data assimilation for calibration. Uh, we got an algorithm from this from the Reading University, and we are eternally grateful, like Tristan Quaid and Natalie Dawkins from there has been, have been valuable in helping with this. And they had done similar work with other crops before, so that was why we ended up using it. And we had three different kind of observations here. We had a leaf area index or green area index. I'll explain the difference soon. We had net X system exchange. Here we use net X system production, but that's the same. It's just a different sign. So it's positive where the NE is negative and so forth. It's for visualization and the model purposes. And then we have yield. So what's the harvest? Uh, and it should be, by the way, said, of course, again, as said, what people are really interested in is the net X system exchange and yield because no farmer is going like, so how green is my field? It's like, what's my yield? So the... Active measurements ran from 2019 to 2022. They still did some soil measurements in 2023 to this spring. Uh, but the majority of the actual observations are for the field study are from 2020. So we used that for the calibration. We ran it as comparison with the other years, but the results I'm going to show you here are from 2020 for reasons I'm about to explain because the thing is, when starting with this, I assumed that this would be a really simple task. Like this would be a 
So as we calibrate, we get a little bit of a different results and then we go from one forward with that. However, when doing this with everything, a single kind of observation, we actually had to take a time to consider, take a stop, look at this looks weird and then look at the observations. What do they represent? What does the model represent when uh, giving comparison observation and what is the dynamical difference between the two? So this ended up being, for a, from my perspective, a much more technical work. And it also is like why when doing this data assimilation, be it calibration or state, you can never really treat it as just a black box. You need to consider the observation dynamics, what the model is doing and everything like that. And I'm about to explain that here. That was smooth of me. So anyway, so to start with LAI, which in essence at first thought would be the simplest one. Turns out there's two different kinds of LAI measurements for each field. There's the plot and the color. And the as you can see, there's a systematic difference between the two. The red line is just a model projection without any calibration. So we talked with the experimental people and they said the plot, the plot measurements, we started, they take a photo of the plot. That's the best way for them was more reliable and it also seemed to match more what the model is giving out like as a concept. So we went with that. However, as you can notice, there's this little bit of an interesting thing in that both sets of observations still show LAI relatively high, even after the model said it should go down. And the reason for this is the model, from the model perspective, LAI is that is there green, while from the in-situ measurements is that is there a leaf. So <laughs> this kind of a problem, but like, because then there's a question, where do we cut off the LAI? When can we use it? But then it turned out that our measurement people had actually analyzed and calculated for 2020 also the green array index from the photograph. So we could use that, which we ended up using. Uh, so here, by the way, in all the calibration results, we're about to say all the data. So all the three different kinds of measurements, uh, GIA, NEP, and yield have been used. So we use that same grade. It's comparable to the model results. Except, as you can see here, for some reason, for example, for barley alone plot, uh, the GIA was actually higher than the LAI, and they explained they had a theory why this is. I didn't personally like. I don't. I can't explain it myself. But at other plots, it's usually that the LAI is lower than low, is, the LAI is higher than Green Array Index. But okay, we have something we can use to Green Array Index. Great. So then we move to any bits, which again turned out to be a tricky subject that haunted, <laughs> haunted us. Because the thing is that while in essence looking at this, you can see like, oh, the like the triangle, which are the observations like above, which are positive for NAP values. The, uh, it's pretty early well, hitting it well. You can then see the negative values there, which is not you hitting and we're not using. Because the thing is, so Stix doesn't do photosynthesis in a traditional sense. It does growth of the plant. And what actually, and when looking at NEP, it's the sum of the soil respiration, and then is how much did the plant grow during that day, which is our uh, proxy for the MPP, which makes sense because the carbon has to go somewhere. The kind of a, as much as sense that makes the kind of a challenge is that in the model, the plant can shrink. So the MPP proxy can never be negative, while in reality, in certain kind of conditions, water drought, uh, enough cloudiness, like long-term cloudiness, the plant can actually respire more than it photosynthesizes. So it can have a negative MPP, which can never happen in the model version. And this created us a problem because it then led us to these situations where it can never hit those negative values. But when we tried using all the data points, the calibration went kind of crazy because we were essentially asking it to do an impossible thing. So what we had to end up doing was to say, don't calibrate the negative values in our current setup. And we've even had discussion, can we use NEP for calibration to begin with if we have to do this kind of removal? Now, it gets a little bit trickier, the topic, because as I said, it includes soil respiration. And while this is a known problem, uh, and some have used a solution in that they also calibrate the soil respiration terms. We are only calibrating the barley terms. The, we didn't do this, but it's not a right or wrong thing. It's more like being aware of the impact, because the thing is, 
we are without a doubt getting solar respiration wrong. As you can see in the June, the solar negative value is a lot lower. The problem with that, however, is that while we know we get the solar respiration wrong, we don't have an isolated data set point for it. And we know that we don't get the plant respiration right either. So if we calibrate the solar respiration, it's going to give us a better fit during the growing season. However, it's almost inevitably going to overestimate the solar respiration, which is going to have a huge impact, especially outside in, in the shorter periods, being at, on the sides of the growth season, which in turn would actually mess up the, pretty badly the soil carbon stocks, which is what people are interested in. Ultimately, however, when we don't do this, we have to remove the negative values from the comparison not knowing if it's the right way always to do it. And it also leads us to basically get periods of time when we don't hit the uh, like the measurement curve correctly because the measurements can go to zero and we can't. So in the middle of the growing season. So this is, I'm not, I'm not saying like, even though we chose not to calibrate the solar respiration, it's justified. But this is again, one of those things you, you have to think about the system. You have to think, what are you actually doing? And you have to be able to answer these questions when you start analyzing the results and get those other working things there. This then leads us to finally the yields. We were hoping this would be the simple one. Spoiler, it isn't. <laughs> so with the yields, what turned out they actually got a really good result from the experimental side because they were able to show that the more there was biodiversity, the more there was cover crops, the yields went down, which makes actually sense because there's a reason why the cover crops were originally like removed and why people focused on mono, like mono plant crop plots. Uh, however, when we then did so the calibration and ran the results. So here are really quick notes. So the measured are the measured values. Uh, sorry about the variation there, it's the standard deviation. And then like the, we had the posterior estimation. Now, the posterior estimate self-calibration is when calibrating with the data from that plot. So for example, the play dot, the data from AC, the barley data for the, from AC is used for the calibration. But the barley calibration there, that's like when the parameter says for comparison, when we just with the barley data. So for the barley only plots calibrate the model, how does that compare? And what we ended up seeing here is that, as you can notice probably as well, is that not only did the barley calibration do about as well, generally as at least as well as the self calibration, it often does better. And this kind of threw us off because, okay, we can work with as well. It means that the model is captured your dynamics correctly, but we couldn't figure out why would it be doing worse than just like when we were actually calibrating with the exact data. But there's a couple of reasons for it. For, so first of all, when you look at the variation, again, it's a standard deviation there, you notice that the barley only has actually a lot less uh, standard deviation than the other sets. And there's two reasons for this. First of all, the first of all, there's eight plots with barley alone, while there's only three plots with every single kind of cover crop. So there's just less data points. But the second is that in a shocking twist, the Finnish soils, they freeze during the winter, which means that the car cover crops die then. They have to be replanted every spring. And when they replant them, they replant about the same time as the barley itself is planted. So there's actually a competition between the cover crop and the barley where the barley generally dominates. The alpha alpha AA is the only one where it doesn't, which leads us to have such a low uh, yield. So, what that is, but this actually leads that there's a huge amount of change between the plots. How well does the cover crop actually take in? There might be some plots where we listed that it's this cover crop, for example, CI, where there actually might not be that much that cover crop to begin with. So we have a variation in that value that's not represented in the model. The second is that it turns out like when we looked at the combinations of different observ observations simulated, in some cover crops, they're actually working against each other. So, for example, including NEP reduces the yield, while another cover crop, including the NEP, meaningfully increases the yield. So there are these by, like seemingly either noise or biodiversity impacts, which kind of counteract each other, which turn, cause issues during the calibration. So the end result here is we have to go back and think a lot more. And we are basically going back to synthetic data more than we probably 
even like we should have probably originally done it more. And also asking these questions like, okay, hey, what observations should we actually use? What are we actually consider? What are the data points we need? So I'm running out of time. I will finish now. If there are, any, thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, feel free to send them to me.